point out I've got a terrible cold, so if at any point my voice gives up, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll do my best to power through. Right then, so, as you know, my name is Douglas Mitchum. Uh, I'm a PhD student from the University of Leicester, uh, and this paper is going to reflect on typology and classifications, and if these concepts can be reconciled with relational approaches. Um, yeah, so to do this, I'm going to utilise my doctoral research on the Neolithic and Bronze Age landscapes of Exmoor National Park to identify the difficulties and to reflect on where we might go next in terms of addressing the key problem that all archaeological studies face um, in understanding how and why forms of specific entity emerge, remain stable, change and sometimes disappear. Perhaps the biggest question from the perspective of assemblage theory, which is the approach that I took, um, is how to resolve the tension between static eternal types and emergent forms which are continuously changing. Um, so, quick introduction. So Exmoor is a remote upland area in the southwest of Britain. Uh, it's partly within the modern counties of North Devon and West Somerset. Uh, the region's prehistoric landscapes are not widely known, um, although Exmoor is home to extensive but fragmentary evidence of the landscapes of the late 3rd and early 2nd millennium BC, and lots of other cool stuff too. So, um, the late Neolithic and Bronze Age stone monuments here are quite unusual. There's a concerted focus on the almost exclusive construction of very small upright stone arrangements. These include small standing stones, rows, circles and other structures, um, such as a distinct form of small cairn which is often associated with the settings, uh, and other features such as ephemeral semicircular activity structures. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Exmoor stone settings are quite regionally distinct. They occur in both geometric shapes and also more fluid forms. Typically the upright stones used are less than 0.5 metres in height. They're often um, 30 or 40 centimetres in height or even less as you can see in that picture. Um, and they are very difficult to find. They lack any real visibility from more than a few metres away. And none of these sites can be directly dated in the, at, the pre at present other than by analogy with similar things in other landscapes. So, sustained interest in the area's stone monuments did not really take place until the early 20th century, um, despite the presence of circles, triangles and parallelograms being noted centuries before by different antiquarians. Um, it was Chantra and Worth who undertook the first major campaign of survey and recording of the area's stone monuments in 1905 and 1906. Uh, they defined a classification scheme based on their geometric shape. Um, it defined forms uh, such as parallelograms and L-shaped settings, the former, for example, comprising nine stones in three rows of three. Um, that's what the little grey blobs are meant to represent there. Um, yes, right, so. These classifications were subsequently used or developed by later researchers, and it became really quite influential in approaches towards the stone settings throughout the 20th century. Um, so, this geometric classification scheme promoted a tendency to describe the sites rather than to offer any detailed interpretation of the stone monuments themselves. It also led to the focus being solely on the layout of the stones. Uh, there was often an assumption during the 20th century work that an underlying geometric design rationale must have existed. Uh, and a, a, a great example of this is Gray's uh, survey of a large stone setting on Ormsworthy Common, which typifies this kind of approach. Um, where he attempted to force the evidence to fit his assumption, uh, planning the site quite unconvincingly as a series of three concentric ovals. And um, that's what you can see on the slide there. Um, so this geometric classification has remained <coughs> excuse me, uh, influential throughout the 20th century, and the terminology was utilised in part by the Major Royal Commission survey of Exmoor's lithic monuments in the late 20th century. Um, however, whilst a few of the sites do form geometric patterns in a broad sense, the great majority don't really fit well into this idea of there being really rigid geometric forms. So, I argue instead um, that the variation which is evident ought to be seen as a defining characteristic of the tradition of raising small standing stones on Exmoor, rather than a source of confusion as to which category we should place the sites in. So the frequent use of very small stones within monuments on Exmoor, proven beyond any doubt by recent excavations, for example, um, at Firshill Common 1 Stone D, which you can see on the slide, 
uh, creates a further difficulty in defining the extent of the site and demonstrates that any arbitrary size criteria or using any arbitrary size criteria as a cutoff point is entirely unhelpful. Um, so this creates a bit of an interpretative dilemma because at many of the sites a number of other small stones are often present uh, with the sites frequently being situated in subtle bands of stone clitter and shallowly buried outcropping rock um, and this questions their assumed geometric regularity. Uh, the Royal Commission survey volume and the 2001 English Heritage Overview both inherited this very limited classification schema and it was beyond their scope to develop new ways of thinking about the settings. Uh, because throughout the 20th century so much focus was placed on the layout of the stones, there was little interest in exploring their wider landscape context until uh, Riley and Wilson North's 2001 overview, which started to do that and made some really key observations. Um, and there are two further issues here, uh, which has been raised by recent research, uh, an increased research focus into the monuments on Exmoor. First, um, this has uncovered evidence of active engagement with these stone arrangements with stones which appear to have been possibly decommissioned and left recumbent deliberately in prehistory and this has been uncovered at Porlock Stone Circle and at First Hill Common One Stone setting and these sites are in completely different parts of Exmoor. Um, this has led Gillings to interpret the sites as fluid and quite um, changeable structures where we might be seeing stones decommissioned, reinstated, perhaps even moved around. Uh, the implication here being that the present state of the arrangements might have more to do with long-lived traditions of people's engagement with them rather than there being an underlying design rationale from the outset that determined how these arrangements look. Um, and my doctoral research has suggested that whilst a number do seem to conform to broad geometric motifs, um, they actually exhibit really quite considerable variation. They don't seem to show a primary concern with producing very specific formal designs, uh, for example, um, they don't tend to have very consistent stone alignments or orientations between the stones. They're quite varied in, in those um, parts. Um, the second issue is that because recent fieldwork has also suggested that the settings are part of wider landscapes of largely non-surface visible features, which includes fields, boundaries and cairns, activity structures and stone spreads, any interpretation that focuses exclusively on the layout of the stones is missing the evidence of what people were doing in their vicinity, which is obviously quite important potentially in interpreting what these sites were. Um, Tilly, for example, recently argued that the stone settings might be associated with deer hunting and that they are metaphorical representations of hunting parties and their social relationships. However, this is rather too dismissive of the early farming landscapes which has been uncovered at some of Exmoor's sites. It also continued to imply that there's an underlying design rationale which echoes the earlier 20th century work that was done, um, which suggests the previously identified types must be meaningful in some way. Right. So, the interpretation of monumentality on Exmoor has been to some extent stifled by a particular classification scheme which does not really adequately account for the variation that's evident in the form of Exmoor stone settings. One gets the impression that any variation from the identified forms can be explained away, um, just uh, for example as uh, part of damage to the site, which due to their small size is admittedly a constant problem. Um, turning this classification into what we might call a true typology was not really attempted by Chanter and Worth, um, most likely because of the total lack of dating evidence that would allow them to come up with any kind of chronological <laughs> scheme within these forms in terms of how they develop. Um, and this, this lack of dating evidence continues to hamper any attempt to understand the chronology of the sites. So, where do we go next? So, my uh, PhD research approached this issue from a relational perspective, based in Deleuzean assemblages, as an alternative to the classificatory approaches which heavily focused on the existence of a series of static types of monument. However, this certainly proved challenging as it is difficult to avoid using some kind of classification. Um, of types, however you want to describe or think about that. Um, I do not hold the opinion though that having a series of identified types which persist is necessarily unhelpful or that taking the further step of defining a typology if you've got the chronological um, information to do so is necessarily no longer helpful. But it must be disconnected from an association with simplistic evolutionary narratives that assume a simple uh, unilinear model of development or progress over time and attempts made to consider complex relationships and multi-causal understandings of change. So the way forward, I think, is to rethink how we understand the emergence, persistence, change and disappearance of different things, either by redefining the concept of typology through a relational perspective, 
or by taking a position directly from relational theory. So, my thesis conducted the first detailed synthesis and interpretation of the late third and early second millennium BC landscapes within Exmoor National Park, uh, using a framework based on Deleuzean assemblages. Uh, I drew on concepts from various other developments of this approach uh, to apply it to the archaeological record. In doing this study, however, a recurrent problem was how to reconcile static classifications of objects and types with an approach that sees things as ever-emergent and always undergoing change. So the key idea here is that everything in the world can be viewed as a series of assemblages <coughs> at a variety of interacting scales. So an assemblage in this context simply means any aggregation of heterogeneous components, forming a definable entity of some sort, like a guitar, for example. Um, Deleuze and Guattari defined a complex set of processes um, which all things are constantly undergoing, which can be applied to the archaeological record. Uh, this then focuses the inquiry on elucidating the specific processes which govern the formation, stability and dispersal of archaeological entities as assemblages. An assemblage ontology can help with a tendency I think we have as archaeologists to classify and typologise things rather than to interpret them more fully. Um, it also avoids focusing on the end product of a monument as a fixed entity, instead forcing us to question why it emerged in the first place, why it was why it stabilised and why it might eventually disperse or become abandoned. Um, my approach was to seek an understanding of the emergence, variations, stability of forms and stability of forms, sorry, from a relational perspective that might allow an understanding of recurring types that was compatible with the Deleuzean concept of things that has ever changing. So if one adopts a Deleuzean perspective, it elucidates a clear set of processes that are always taking place, which govern the territorialization, that is the stability, and the deterritorialization, the dispersal of assemblages. Um, so concerning both the relationships within and between different assemblages. So whilst these processes are generic, taking place within and between all assemblages at every scale of analysis, they provide us as archaeologists with a mechanism to elucidate and question what the specific processes governing the stability, change and disappearance of specific types of things are at any given historical moment. I would argue that it is these processes and the complex relationships between different assemblages that are missing from a traditional archaeological typology and that a Deleuzean approach allows us to question and elucidate what is taking place between the types. So what's going on on Mike's volcano slopes? Um, this gives us one aspect, I think, of, of beginning to try and understand this issue from a relational perspective. Uh, but there's another problem, because eternal static types do not, strictly speaking, exist in a Deleuzean framework, because every assemblage is a unique and historically distinct entity. It's always undergoing processes of change. So in this understanding, types, however seemingly fixed, are never actually static entities, and they remain under the influence of the territorialising and deterritorialising processes. So their apparent stability is the result of the processes working towards their territorialization, for example, being much greater than the forces of territorialization that happen to be trying to tear them apart. Um, so this leads to the second key point, which is that our classifications and the related concept of typology need to be rethought within a relational approach. Classifications and typologies, as Sorensen has pointed out, were describing something that was apparent in the material <coughs> being studied. Um, I think that it's crucial to remember that a classification or a typology is not a reflection of the full range of variation apparent in a given type of artefact, but a momentary snapshot of this variation and change, which is defined by the archaeologist who ultimately chose the scale of analysis in the first place, like taking a Polaroid picture. Um, so how can we explore the experi experiential sorry, and material qualities of the beings and things that our picture cannot capture? So, through people's interaction with and experience of the stone settings, I argued that very powerful effective fields and effective capacities could emerge that made them at certain times very potent structures, um, with similar effects to those discussed uh, for, for example, miniature objects and small-scale environments like uh, in the work of Douglas Bailey and Alton DeLong and Susan Stewart and others. Um, so, affectivity is the concept that things can simultaneously affect bodies as bodies affect them which originated from Spinoza's work and was highly influential on Deleuze. So it's Deleuze and Guattari's reading of Spinoza that bodies and beings were defined not by formal characteristics, but by their capacity to affect other things and to be affected themselves, that I think is key here. So in my work, I try to utilise Harrison Sorensen's effective field concept, which is a network through which emotions are generated between people and things 
to explore the experiential and material qualities of the standing stones. So the widespread adoption of stone settings on Exmoor was partly, I argue, the result of the recognition of the potential power of such distinct and um, effective capacities. Um, that these sites can encourage to emerge when people experience them reaching a critical point, leading to the development of regionally distinct forms of monumentality focusing on small stones. Therefore, the effective capacities of things might help us to explain why certain forms of entities persist whilst others do not. So I suggest it might be possible to use Deleuze and Guattari's reading of Spinoza to develop a concept of types and typology based not solely on formal characteristics, but that considers the capacity of things to affect other things and then to themselves be affected. So, to conclude, this paper has argued that there is a real need for archaeologists to formulate understandings of the emergence and persistence of forms or types that is compatible with relational approaches rather than unconsciously using these older classifications and concepts without engaging with them more fully. I have argued that assemblage theory can provide us with a guiding framework that can allow us to question and elucidate what is happening between the types, as well as an alternative understanding of thinking about types and our classifications of things. Such classifications can, although they don't always have to, stifle the development of interpretation in favour of description. I have shown that aspects of assembly theory can provide an alternative understanding of types and variation and suggested some ideas that might be useful in developing this understanding further. Finally, I would argue that it's very difficult for archaeologists to avoid um, some form of a classification and that therefore a new understanding of the type is needed which sees form not as a static type puzzle but that accounts more fully for the dynamic capacity of things to affect other things and beings. Thank you for listening.